uh, with a roll call. First up, Tony Lewis. Here. Scott Miller. Here. Ann Oberchain. Heather Williams. Jen Archuleta. Paula Fitzgerald. I'm here. Trace Baker. Here. Stephen Myrick. I'm here. Jim Krug, present. Uh, next item of business is the approval, or the first time I should say, approval of the November 19th, 2020 uh, meeting minutes. Uh, so is there any questions or revisions? I have one. Uh, Ann couldn't be here tonight, so she'd like the minutes corrected. To, her comment is verbatim. I have uh, abstained from the map update motion. Uh, I did not vote. I, so if we could make a note of that for the record, uh, and voted, uh, she did not vote I on the uh, map update. Is there any other additions, corrections, revisions? At this time, the chair will entertain a motion. Paula Fitzgerald, I move to approve the minutes as corrected by Ann. Trace Baker, second. Any other further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed like sign. And I will abstain as, uh, and I want to thank Jen for filling in for me uh, last month, but I will abstain as I was absent on the 19th. Uh, um, Scott Miller, I was also absent, so I'll also abstain. Okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, next item of business, uh, thank you, Mel, for coming out tonight. We have the, correct me if I mispronounce it, the Stromquest Labor Fee Acquisition. That's pretty close. Good evening, uh, POSAC members. This is Mel Stonebreaker, Parks and Open Space staff. So Boulder County is here tonight, or we're here tonight, to propose that we pay $1,610,000 to acquire fee title in 175 acres of what is known as the Stromquist labor property. Along with that would be associated water rights. Um, for more than a hundred years, this, the Stromquists and the Henrys and a little bit before them, the Hartshorn families all lived and farmed the top of this hill. That, uh, um, and the Stromquist labor property is the most Southern part of what was that sort of traditional family run farm. It actually, it goes beyond the, the 500 or so acres that we've talked about here and goes further north. And those families uh, uh, married each other and, and the property moved around, but it was all fundamentally farmed by the same group of people for more than a hundred years, as I say. And the, um, the irrigation was structured with that in mind. They were all related and family members. And so all these parcels, most of which are now owned by Boulder County, um, irrigate through a fairly sophisticated system um, in which water comes up from the south, uh, mostly Boulder and White Rock water, and it enters the property in three different areas. And it has to be split um, in some cases as much as three times to get to different parts of different properties. Um, and, and all that water runs through Stromquist labor before it gets further on to the land that, that Boulder County owns now. Um, Mel, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you please. mean to be showing slides while you're doing this? No, I wasn't thinking I would, but maybe I should. Okay, uh, thank you. Let me see if I can, if I can do this properly. Um, can you see that now? Is it no? Uh, okay, hold on. Here we go. Can you see that now? I beg your pardon. It's not working, is it? Huh. Let me see. Here we go. Now, can you see that? There we go. All right. Uh, thank you. And uh, let me kind of start again a little bit. But 
you can see this area, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the area to the north of the Stromquist labor property here is what we call Henry Eastlack, which is a large property here. And Denzel Henry, these are both members of what was the Henry family. Um, and then the Ross property and then Stromquist labor. As I say, all these, all these families uh, sort of intermarried and, and owned this land collectively for more than a hundred years. In fact, even the land further north of what we call Stromquist Farms was all part of roughly 600 acres of, of ground um, that was owned and irrigated as one productive farm over the years. Um, so in, in 1998, the county acquired a conservation easement over the Stromquist labor property and a 50% interest in 192.75 shares of Boulder and White Rock Ditch um, and 75 units, a 50% interest in 75 units of Northern Colorado Conservancy Water, which is more commonly called Big T. Um, so the Stromquists have now come to us and, and they're ready to sell their con this 175 acre parcel and the family's remaining 50% interest in the Boulder and White Rock and Big T water. So that's kind of the background that brings us here tonight. Um, so, so Parks and Open Space would like to acquire this water and reintegrate it into this larger piece. And as I was saying before, one of the main reasons for that is because right now this all irrigates reasonably well, although there is still some tension between our tenants and the Stromquist family to the south on occasion, but, but we all work together and, we, and it works out all right. If this property were to be sold to another landowner that, that wasn't quite as in sync with the county as, as the Stromquists have always been, um, trying to irrigate our property to the north would become considerably more difficult. On top of which, because we have the Stromquists trying to pull their water even now, the feeling is if we owned all of this property, um, the, the, our ag people think that we could improve uh, irrigation efficiency by between 10 and 15%. And if you think about it in terms of all the boulder and white rock we have on, on the land to the north, that would be like acquiring maybe 40 or 45 shares of boulder and white rock water um, just through increased efficiency. So that's one of the main reasons that our ag group is so excited about this acquisition. But, um, so the proposal, the deal term proposal would be that the Boulder, the parks and open space would also like to acquire the Boulder and White Rock water, as I said, but, but does not want to purchase additional big T. In the proposed transaction, the undivided big T would need to be divided so that each party could own 37.5 units. So we would take those 75 units that are on the land now and we would divide those so that the county had 100% interest in 37.5 units and the Stromquist had 100% interest in 37.5 units. After doing that, the county would pay $1,610,049 for the property, which would include its two sprinkler systems and the remaining 50% interest in the 192.75 shares of Boulder and White Rock. And finally, the Stromquists have agreed that they would donate an additional 12.5 units of Big T to the county as part of this transaction. So it's complicated and the numbers are not easy to absorb, but um, I, I hopefully the table below there will help you understand what we're proposing. Let me show you some pictures. As I said before, the, the Boulder and White Rock comes in here. The, the peak of this, of this hill is kind of right along this property line. And there are siphons that bring water up to this, this, this zenith of the hill. And then the water runs downhill going to the north. So our irrigation water today runs right through here. And it gets split off here. And, go, and, and, and the Stromquist can take water here. It goes all the way up north and then everything irrigates this way to the east for the most part. It, the, the Boulder and White Rock also comes up here and goes up through Ross. And again, it can split here. We own a Ross property on, on Weld County. The water also has to get all the way over there. 
So it, it's, as I say, it's a very complicated ir irrigation system. Having said that, there is good water on all of this property. And if it's managed it well, this could be arguably the most productive farm that the county has. Um, let me show you some pictures of it. So this is, as it says, looking southeast from the corner of the property. Um, and you, we don't get an opportunity to acquire 175 acres much these days. Um, so given where we're at at the moment, this is a large parcel. And you can get a sense of that when you see these pictures. But um, this is one of the pivot sprinklers you can just see there in the, in the, in the picture. This is the other pivot there. But. So go back to my map. So let me continue. It, this acquisition would include all of the mineral rights owned by the sellers, uh, but the property is subject to active oil and gas leases. There are uh, several wells on the property that are producing now. Um, so we would acquire the property subject to those leases. And if they decided that they wanted to, you know, expand those wells or drill additional wells, um, the county, we, 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 they would be under our current regulations, but we couldn't prohibit them from doing that. Um, so under our Boulder County Comprehensive Plan, this property is considered um, part of the East County Environmental Conservation Area and it's designated significant agricultural land of national importance. Um, staff would Enough. recommend th this approval. So adding this 175 acres of the Stromquist labor, labor property to the existing 405 acres of county owned open space would create 180 acres of contiguous county owned agricultural land. This would put the entire historic farm back together and would allow the 580 acres to be operated as one unit the way it was originally designed to be. The Stromquist labor property pulls the same irrigation water from the same irrigation infrastructure as the rest of the adjacent county owned land. Having this property under county ownership so that the irrigation can be done in concert across the entire 580 acre complex would greatly increase irrigation efficiency and would enhance the overall farm viability. The commensurate increase in irrigation efficiency would allow some of the big T or might allow some of the big T acquired in this transaction to be moved to other open space properties that have less irrigation water available. And finally, our ag uh, group feels that uh, they could diversify crops on this property and they, because there is sufficient water, particularly if it was all irrigated as one larger piece so that they might grow barley, corn and wheat as well. So I'm here tonight to ask for your rep uh, recommendation to the Boulder County Commissioners to approve our acquisition of the Stromquist Labor Farm. Thank you, Mount. Hey, uh, let the record show, the minutes show that Heather Williams has joined us. And uh, we'll go in questions. We'll just go down the group, but I'll start with the, uh, the land magnets and the agricultural wizards. Scott Miller, I'll start with you, and then Stephen, I'll come to you. So, Scott. <laughs> Um, yeah, Mel, um, <clears throat> one question on the big T water, there's that 12 and a half acre donation. So is, are they ending up with 25 and the county's ending up with 50? Am That's I correct. reading? Okay. <clears throat> and then do you know what the properties to the north, who's leasing those and what's going on on those right now? What's going on? Uh, at it's a variety of row crops. I mean, uh, Craig Sturkel uh, leases the Henry Eastlack property, and that's the largest piece up there. And I think Craig rotates corn and, and then some, some grain crops like barley and wheat. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. And my other, 
<clears throat> Sorry, I got a frog in my throat. My other thing is more of a comment, just that was talking about how, you know, how old the Stronghold family is in Bangor County. For some of the members of POSAC haven't been around for a while, actually, the original ag director of, Posa, uh, of Open Space was actually Luke Stromquist. So that just goes to show you how involved they've been in this from, since the start of Open Space, basically. Okay. That's a very good point, yeah. Scott. And, and um, I should say that Lucy Stromquist, his mother, has always been a very strong supporter of our program, even in the beginning when it wasn't always maybe as fashionable to be, she was always there standing with us. So Super. Um, they've been good friends of ours for a long time. Thank you, Scott. Steven, we'll go to you. Uh, no questions, thank you. No questions. Uh, Paula, how about to you? Um, no questions. I just want would like, uh, you know, maybe Mel, if you can pass on the thanks to the Stromcast for the very sizable donation of water. That's that's a very significant donation. I'll do that. Very yeah. good. Thank you, Paula. Tony, any questions? Yeah, just one, Mel. Can you tell me um, what makes a piece of property nationally significant agricultural land? Like, I'm just curious what that means. Well, the main thing is that, um, and maybe Scott could answer this better than I can, but um, it, the main thing that, that raises it to that sort of top level or higher level is, is the fact that it's irrigated farm ground. Um, that's the number one thing that, that they look for. That makes it nationally significant. Yeah, because there are huge, great tracts of our beautiful country that are not irrigated. Um, exactly. So to be irrigated is, is considered a, a sort of higher level. Okay. I'd also just add, there's a, I think there's a whole formula and I'm a little rusty on it, but having worked for the Colorado Department of Ag, I saw it at one point and it's a whole laundry list of things, including um, access to markets, ability to move um, goods to market relatively easily, soils, but irrigation, available, availability of irrigation water is a pretty significant factor in how they weight it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Heather? Any questions? Uh, no questions, thank you. Trace? Uh, yeah, Trace Baker here. Uh, thank you, Mel. Um, when you mentioned the oil and gas leases, mm -hmm. uh, from looking at the satellite imagery, it looked there might be four installations on the property. And if they expand that, would that be to um, expand the existing installations or would they be able to put in new well pads or tanks or anything like that in other locations? Well, I don't know how much time you've had to read the sort of new regulations that have been put in place. And the, yeah, county, I have not. The, the county has been even a little more stringent than the state at this point. But um, having said that, they could apply for new pads, as I understand it. Um, and as long as they were within the regulations, they would be considered. Yeah. Um, I don't know, frankly, why they would do new pads with, with vertical drilling um, these days. They don't really need new pads most of the time. They can drill where they want to now. Yeah. Um, but you couldn't say for sure that they, they wouldn't apply to try to get new ones. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trace. Uh, I don't have any uh, questions, Mel, just a, just, a, just a comment. I think it's a neat piece of uh, property and to echo what Paula said, very generous when I, uh, being a bit of a recovering engineer, looking at that amount of water, I thought, boy, in the county, that's a, that's a bonus. So uh, hats off to you guys. I think it's a, it's a good deal from my perspective. So at this point, uh, I'll ask, is there any online public comments? Okay. Good evening, Donna. Hi, my name is Donna George. I live at 466 Lawn Tally Hill Court, and I am in favor of um, this acquisition. I think it's a great idea, um, especially with the water rights. And I also have, I didn't know what else, but I have some general comments, not specific to this. Is this a time to do that, or do you have a time, another time for that? Uh, we'd like to do that under any new business, probably. Is any of the words, 
your comments are not related to this acquisition? No, no. Okay, could you just hang on to those uh, for another yeah. time, please? Yeah, and okay. Thank you, uh, thank you for calling in tonight. On but this I am, time. yeah, I am in, in de definitely in favor of this. All righty, thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there any other public comments? Uh, that being said, at this time, the chair will entertain a motion. I move that we uh, approve the purchase of this property per staff's recommendation. Mr. Speaker, second. Any further discussion? With no further discussion, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Any abstentions? Let the record show the motion's been approved. Thank you, Mel, for coming out tonight, you, as Bill. always. Appreciate it. Thanks, nice Mel. Nice to see you all. Well, there she is. There she is, the star of the show. Uh, next up is the Parks and Open Space 2021 Stewardship and Capital Improvement Projects, and we have Tina with us. So, Tina, thank you for coming out tonight, and uh, have at it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Good evening, members of the P Parks and Open Space Advisory Committee. It's, um, it's been a long time since I've been before you. Um, Tony, nice to meet you. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about our, um, well, it's something I get to do every year, um, to talk about our Parks and Open Space Improvement Projects that we're proposing for 2021. Um, this year, we've changed things up a little bit as, as you likely saw in the memo. So I'll also be talking about um, a whole new category of, of funding for projects called the Stewardship Fund. So um, hopefully this is all gonna work. I'm gonna start off, um, well, here's how it's gonna go. Um, I've got a lot of material to cover. And um, what we always do is we start off with a, um, just a celebration of accomplishments from the capital projects or what we're calling the post-it projects. Um, from this year. So I'm gonna start off um, showing you a story map, which is a GIS product. Um, it's, it's kind of a new thing for us. So um, this is a kind of a new thing that you'll get to see. I'll, I'll demonstrate a little bit of the bells and whistles of it. It will be then posted to the web and um, the public will get to do it. It's an interactive product. I'll show you some of the bells and whistles, but um, I'd be very interested in hearing any feedback you have about this, this new kind of um, presentation um, method that we're trying out. Um, after that, we'll talk about the 2021 proposed uh, post-it projects. Um, I've got a PowerPoint for that. Again, this is also a little bit new because we pre-recorded it so that instead of me just being the talking head up here, you'll get to hear from all the actual um, subject matter experts um, about their plans for next year. And then um, I'm not planning on talking on spending much time talking about the stewardship fund projects in much detail because we'll be coming back to you um, in the future over over the course of next year to talk a lot more about all the work we've done leading up to them. And you'll have lots of opportunities to learn more at that time. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to focus more on the post up side of things. But I'd be, we have a lot of staff here on um, on the meeting who are available to answer your questions. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who knows a little bit about a lot of things, but for deeper dives, uh, we may wanna, if you need more information, we may wanna call on some of those other, other staff. So I'm gonna now pull up the story map here and uh, share my screen. Let's see. All right, hopefully you can all see that now. Nick, are we good? All right, so um, I cannot see your faces at this point. So if you have questions, feel free to just pipe up. Um, so this is, is a story map, like I, like I mentioned, and you'll see my cursor as I'm moving around. Up here along the top, are the various categories of funding of projects and you can scroll back and forth through them. 
I'm not going to be clicking on those, but that's just um, for your information if you come back. So, you know, as, as, as you know, our mission is to conserve natural, cultural, and agricultural resources and provide public uses, which reflect sound resource management and community values. And um, so every year we do, we do adopt, we ask you to recommend adoption of our, um, our POSIP plan for the next year. Um, this plan helps us prioritize uh, capital improvements on our, on our open space and engage the public um, prior to implementation of new projects. It also provides a framework for us to seek partnerships and grant fundings, which um, are really a big help in leveraging our budget. Now, normally our budget is $775,000 for capital projects. Um, this budget is, comes out of sales tax revenues. And um, as we all know, with COVID this year, um, we were worried about the impacts to the sales tax revenues. So back in April, we made the decision to put a hold or delay a number. So five of our projects that were approved for this year, which was 24, uh, we put a hold on. So here, this little chart shows the original budget. You see the 70, 775,000 plus the partner and grant funds. Um, the projects we held did not affect our partner contributions and grant funds. So our, um, our new budget, our revised budget was approximately $500,000 with um, still the partner contributions and grant funds. So we were still able to leverage our um, budget um, nearly sixfold. So now I'm just gonna kind of go through category by category, the different projects. So I'm going to start with agricultural. We're going to go through the categories in, in alphabetical order. So starting with agriculture. And um, what you'll see here is we had two projects in agriculture. Um, the two properties are listed here. And the map shows the properties as well. So I'm, I'm not going to do this for every map, but, but I am going to just expand this map and show you, in case you ever want to come back and look at it, how, how it works. So there's a little icon here that allows you to expand the map and then you see these icons here these are interactive so you can tap on them and that will zoom in so you can see this is um this is north uh, sorry a little bit north mostly west of longmont and um, this is along the saint brain and this is the pella crossing property so if you then click on the icon um, there are some layers within GIS that have additional information. So this gives you the opportunity to look at those layers. In this particular case, there's not a lot of um, very scintillating information, but um, you can see that there is, there is that kind of information there. So um, anyway, I just wanted to give you a little demonstration of how that works. Um, there's also some controls down here that um, will allow you to enlarge or decrease the size of the map. So as you can see, there are three properties that are involved with these two projects. And um, now I'm gonna scroll down and show you a little bit more of the text here. So this, this gives you a little bit more of the backstory. The Boulder County Land Venture project was an upgrade to the center pivot sprinkler on this property. And um, what we did here was we upgraded to um, install new electric service to replace the diesel generator that had been used to power the center pivot sprinkler, which um, makes it a more sustainable and um, environmentally friendly um, operation. Then um, moving on to the second project, which was on Heron Lake and Lake 4 over at Western Mobile, um, we installed water measuring devices and um, the reason that we are doing that is that it, installing these, um, this equipment, which is called weirs, it allows us to better manage our water. We can um, detect dam leaks and seepage and keep better, more accurate uh, record of the water in our reservoirs. So um, all the water that we own requires a lot of management and sometimes it's costly. And that's why these things were in the capital project um, budget. So moving on now to ecosystems projects. Um, we have seven projects in this category. The properties are listed here and shown on the map. And um, we'll start with ag pollinator habitat. So um, every year we do a lot of work with our ag tenants to improve 
various parts of the property that aren't being actively um, farmed. And oftentimes that will be corners where the center pivots are. And so this year, as in most years, we purchase seed and then the ag tenants do the planting. And, um, and this, this photo here is just a photo of our seed storage, <laughs> our seed storage room that's in the, um, it, at our parks um, facility over there in Longmont. Um, and this is a picture of Carrie Simo, who's a plant ecologist and runs a lot of volunteer plant um, projects. So the next project that uh, we have here is on the ZAP property. ZAF is a, is a property that we purchased, uh, I believe in 2018. So it's a pretty new property. Um, it's, it's got a lot of really interesting things going on. Um, the South Branch ditch of the St. Brain Creek runs through it. It's prime habitat for Preble's metal jumping mice, which as you know, is a listed um, uh, species. And it's also a, got an active agricultural lease on it. So really what we're trying to do here is balance the needs of our ag tenants and um, the riparian health of the South Branch, um, really uh, you know, in, to make sure that the prebles continue to thrive. And we do do a lot of trapping and monitoring of those populations. Um, and so there are a lot of things that we wanna do on this property, including fencing, livestock watering improvements, and uh, future revegetation and plantings. The, the work that we did this year was to install some fencing, which helped kept, keep the, um, the grazing cattle out of the riparian area. The next project on the list for ecosystems is the Niwot Ditch Fish Passage. Try saying that fast 10 times. <laughs> this is um, located on the Golden Fredstrom property. It's just downstream from Pella Crossing and it's also right across the street from our offices um, out in Longmont. Um, it's a pretty complicated project and um, has, um, has been made possible by funding from a number of partners. You'll see more about it in the PowerPoint I'll show you here in a little bit. Um, but basically we're trying to make the dam be more friendly to the fish to let them pass up and down as they do um, their movements through the creek. And um, here is, is kind of a photo, you can't see it very well, but the, the actual ditch or the dam that's there right now is in this location and it's also back in here. And again, you'll see more about this in the PowerPoint in a minute. The next project in the ecosystems category is um, uh, the Lower Boulder Creek. So this was a huge project that was completed in 2016. Um, it was about a million dollar um, project that the Army Corps of Engineer funded and, and really did um, the restoration to return the oxbows to this section of uh, Boulder Creek um, across one mile on the Alexander Dawson property. Um, and the, the funding that we're doing now is um, to help us with the maintenance agreement that we have to maintain the plantings that are uh, being established and monitor them to make sure that they're successful. So this is an ongoing project for five years. I believe we're in year two this year. The next project is also on Boulder Creek, a little bit downstream from the reach that I just talked about. Um, it's a restoration project that has also been identified as a high priority in the Boulder Creek Master Plan. And um, we're in the permitting and planning stage this year. Um, you'll probably be hearing more about this in future years. Um, the goal is to construct a, another fish passable diversion and some other stream improvements. And again, this is another project that is made possible by funding from multiple partners. Uh, the next, and I believe the last project in the ecosystem category is a uh, wetlands assessment. And this year we did phase one of that. Um, as you all probably are aware, wetlands are some of the most valuable habitat that we have, especially given our arid climate here uh, in Boulder County. So um, this is a, a project to update the data that we have maintained for quite a while and um, and make it more comprehensive as well as add properties that um, have been more recently acquired um, using the protocols that are set forth by the Colorado Natural Heritage Program. And this picture just shows a screenshot of the, um, the data collection there. 
Um, this year we did complete phase one, which covered a lot of the southern portion of the county and we'll be doing phase two in 2021. And again, you'll be hearing a little bit more about that in the PowerPoint. Moving along to historic preservation projects, there, are th there were three this year, two on the Brawley property, the Brawley barn and the Brawley garage, and then um, one on the Hall Ranch property, which was the Tumbleson house. And so the Brawley barn, as you can see in the photo here, is um, a very old structure. It was built around 1903. Um, it's located on, it's, it's actually called the Wenzel Farm is the, um, the historically accurate name. Uh, we brought, we purchased the Brawley property in 2000. It's, it's 112 acres. We're hoping to open it to the public um, in the fairly near future. We, we, have, we have just completed some of the flood damage projects out there, the reservoirs, and you've heard a lot about that over the course of the year and the years. Um, and uh, we, will be, we will be increasing the recreational amenities, a trail, a trailhead parking lot and so on there in the in coming years. So this is all kind of getting us ready for that. Here you can see a, a historic photo of the barn from around 1949. Um, Carol Beam, our historic preservation specialist, um, applied for a grant from the State Historic Fund. Um, we were awarded $200,000 and that funded phase one, um, the scope of work uh, included structural repairs and um, engineering fees and archeology span monitoring as well. Um, and here's another cool feature of a story map. So I can do this little slide thing which shows you before and after. Uh, so that's another cool little interactive feature on a story map. Uh, the Brawley Garage, which is just west of the Brawley Barn on the same property, it's you know right there within a stone's throw, um, is, is a contributing factor to the historic significance of it, although it's not nearly as old by a long shot. Um, but it also was in need of repairs. So we, um, we had our historic, uh, our, our buildings and historic preservation team out there doing the work to do some repairs on there. And you can see for example, in this photo right here, an example of that work. And here's just a photo of Brian Bartell, who um, was one of those team members who worked so hard on that. Um, moving on to Hall Ranch, this is the Tumbleson House, which I'm sure you've all seen. It's, it's right next to the uh, resident ranger residence uh, right off Highway 7 as you head west from Lyons. And um, this, again, another old building, it, it dates back to around 1890. Um, we did, we did a, a pretty major rehabilitation with a GOCO legacy grant back in 2001. And um, we, we discovered that there was asbestos in the building. And in the process of uh, doing the asbestos mitigation, some foundation issues were discovered. And so we hired a contractor to do some crack stitching. And you can see in this photo, some of the areas where that was done. Um, here's another photo that shows that. So basically um, a specialist went in there and took the old grout out, installed some uh, rebar and new grout to stabilize the, um, the building. And ultimately this building may or may not ever be used for anything, but when we do, an update to the Hall Ranch management plan. Um, that update is scheduled for whenever the, um, the mine reclamation is completed on the Hall 2 property. Um, we will be looking at some options for using this building. So we really do wanna keep it in, in a shape that will allow us to have those options in the future. So moving on to the forestry uh, category, uh, we did have one forestry project this year that um, involved thinning at Heil Valley Ranch. And um, so we, we do that because we want to reduce the fuel since fire has been suppressed since the mid to late 1800s. You know, the, the um, density of forest has become a lot thicker. And this particular location was chosen because of its location on the eastern end edge of Heil Valley Ranch. 
um, with the uh, neighborhood right on the other side of the hogback. And, and we did, again, as with most of our forestry projects, um, we did get FEMA pre-disaster mitigation funds to help us do it because these are very expensive. This particular project, because of the steep nature of the terrain, um, was done with helicopters, so helicopter logging, which is you know, obviously quite expensive. Um, so we did complete the fuel reduction on 162 acres. Here's another before and after slider. So um, unfortunately, the size of my screen doesn't allow you to see the whole thing, but there's a before and hopefully you can see after. It's a little thinner, especially on the upper edge of the screen. Um, and here's another one. This is actually a little bit better. You can see how dense the, um, this is on the Lichen Loop Trail looking east. You may be familiar with this, but you can see how dense the, the vegetation, the trees are here. And now you can see uh, a pretty dramatic difference with the thinning that happened there. Now, and sadly, the fire came through in October and burned through all of this area as well as in the entirety of, of High Valley Ranch. Um, however, what Stefan Reinald, our forestry specialist, has said is that we believe that the thinning treatment did um, have an impact because the trees in the thinned areas retained more needles than the trees that were not that, that were not in the thinned areas, which um, I don't know what I just did there, which causes us to to believe that um, the fire intensity was a little bit lower in the areas where we did our thinning. So if that makes sense, um, I will go ahead and show you this before and after as well. So it, it's a little bit sad to see what it looks like now post fire, um, but there you have it. Moving on to uh, recreation and facility projects. We have five projects this year in this category. Um, you can see them listed here and also they're shown on the map. Um, starting off with the Toland Ranch pro project. Um, you can see by this map, the Toland Ranch was a conservation easement we purchased. Um, in 2015, you can see that a lot of it is in Gilpin County, but it, it, did, it does, it's over 300, it's over 3,000 acres. It's adjacent to the Eldora Ski Area. Um, it includes a six and a half mile long trail easement. So we've been doing work since the purchase in 2015 um, to get ready to build the trail, including doing class three cultural resource survey in 2018, um, applying for a GOCO grant in 2019, which we uh, was awarded to us in 2020. I believe that was $311,000. And this year we, um, we just finalized um, hiring of a contractor who will begin the trail construction next year and possibly into 2022 if needed. Also this year, we had a, uh, we were able to host a youth group out of Netherland to build one mile of trail um, as a socially distanced volunteer project. Um, so uh, we're really excited about this. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that from Al Hardy in the PowerPoint. And um, one of the stipulations when we bought the property was that uh, not, it wasn't part of the purchase, but it was part of um, some of our grant funding was that the trail has to be open no later than um, 2024. Um, so let's see here. So the next project in this category is the Anu White Trail. This is uh, this is a property that was significantly impacted by the flood of 2013, and um, it closed for quite a while. Two of the homesteads, or two of the houses that are right, um, you can see them here in this aerial photo. The, these two houses were both destroyed in the flood and they were part of the FEMA buyout. So we, we are now in, in possession of those properties. Uh, the County Transportation Department finalized road work and access work in 2019. The trail has been done for, um, for a while and it did open this year. What we, what we were doing this year was um, looking at whether we could put uh, a permanent restroom facility. And because of the location of the parking lot in the, um, in, it's mostly in the floodplain, it's a little bit tricky. So we have had to jump through a bunch of hoops to get the permitting. Um, and we were able to do that. You can see here, there's a porta potty in the existing parking lot right now. 
um, we, we got the permits and we had planned to fund the restroom in next year's capital improvement project budget, but we decided to hold off. And uh, because again, we cut back our budget because of sales tax revenue impacts related to COVID. So that's on hold for at least another year potentially, but the um, porta potty will stay there. So you'll probably be seeing more about this in the future. So um, bouncing back to Heil Valley Ranch, um, the Heil 2 um, purchase um, back in 2012 gave us the opportunity to add a bunch of new amenities and infrastructure, trailheads and trails. And uh, we, did, we did adopt a small area plan for those improvements in May 20, uh, 2016. Um, the Overland Loop Trail opened in 2017. The Schoolhouse and Corral um, trailhead opened in 2019, and you can see some of the infrastructure, the, um, the caboose there. Um, this year, we, um, we were trying to wrap up um, a number of things, including the skills trail and construction and the ADA trail in the corral area, plus a, an enclosure for a porta potty at the Altona Schoolhouse and some upgrade, upgrades to the main trailhead. So most of those projects we have completed, but once again, the fire came along in October. Um, we were very lucky that it did not destroy the amenities that we have um, that we have been building, but it has caused some delays in completing the work. So we're hoping to finish those things up in 2021. Now moving to Boulder Canyon, the Castle Rock um, area is, um, at, you can see Boulder Canyon Road here. We're looking to the north and you can see the road that comes off of the highway. This is a very popular picnicking and um, climbing area. And um, as a result, we've got a network of um, fairly unsustainable social trails. So this year we worked with um, a group called the Front Range Climbing Stewards to consolidate and improve the trail network. We got them under contract to do the work and um, they helped really consolidate those routes and make them more sustainable. And you can see, this is a, a picture uh, before, which kind of looks like a mad jumble. And now you can see a hardened trail here that um, is much more sustainable and, um, and easy to see where you're supposed to go. Uh, moving on to the Agricultural Heritage Center. Um, this is off of Hi State Highway 66 on the west side of Longmont. Um, we've been doing a lot of improvements here over, over the years to um, the irrigation. And um, this kind of came out of a survey that we did to our visitors that um, they said they would like to see more plants and more grass and so on. So, um, we've been working on this for a while. We've also done some site work to improve drainage and so on. So that um, wrapped up this year as well. And then moving on to our public education and outreach category. This is also, um, they have one project and it's also at the Ag Agricultural Heritage Center. So same location. Um, we opened the Ag Heritage Center 20 years ago. And over the course of 20 years, some of the exhibits are now tired and worn um, from all those little hands and pitter patter of feet. And um, so it, it, it was really um, time to take a fresh look and we're gonna be updating the themes of those exhibits as well as replacing them. So um, the, the ones that we're replacing are listed here and we're examining um, some themes that you'll hear more about from Pascal in, um, in the PowerPoint. We, we to, to stretch our capital dollars, we split this over two years. So we hired the contractor this year. They've done some design work and they'll be finishing it up um, in the early part of next year. So that is it for my, um, my sharing of the, um, the story map. Maybe I'll take a quick pause there and see if anyone has any questions about our 2020 um, capital improvement accomplishments. Okay. Uh, hey, Tina, I just have a, I have a comment. Is that, uh, I, I, I hope you guys got some direction from the uh, finance folks as far as setting your budget for next year. So in other words, 
I appreciate you guys. You, you know, you you downgraded what you wanted to do and took those projects projects out. But hopefully you got some feedback on that. And the only other comment I'd make to that is it looks like from what I read this afternoon coming out of the, you know, coming down from the feds, there's not going to be any money for state and local governments, right? So if that goes down, I, I don't think it's necessarily next year. It's going to be the year after that. I think you're going to have probably some funding, you know, going to have to probably cut again would be my guess. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not interested in digging down into the project, so to speak, and into the weeds more so than sort of taking that uh, 30,000 foot view. Do you feel comfortable that those you, you've eliminated or put off those, the right projects and you're working on the right ones? Does that make any sense? Yes, and, and I'll take a stab at it. And I see that Eric's popped in, so he may want to add a little bit as well. Um, we, did, we did a pretty, um, comprehensive evaluation of our projects and um, the ones that we put on hold, we feel, I mean, they're all important, but we feel, we felt that they were able to be um, delayed without um, compromising much on the services that we provide. So um, for one example is the Lagerman um, Reservoir property where we had been planning to expand the parking lot there to accommodate to better accommodate horse trailer parking. Um, we saw a huge increase in the use at Lagerman Reservoir this summer, but we still feel like it was functioning fairly well. So that was one we felt wasn't a super high priority. I mean, it, it, it's a nice to have, but maybe not um, super important for right now. Over time, we'll get back to it. Um, and um, so again, I think the ones that we put on hold were ones that did not um, jeopardize our leveraged funding, like the grants and the partnership um, funds that we got, and we'll be able to come back to them. You'll see, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but you'll see with our 2021 budget, we've also targeted 500,000 instead of the normal 775. And, um, but we've done a great job of, of really stretching the funds that we have through those um, partnerships and grants. Okay, thanks. Eric, did you yeah. want to say yeah, thank you. Uh, and I think Tina accurately characterized it. I think we, we made good decisions. Um, and when the pandemic hit and we got some serious concerns about what sales tax revenue was going to, uh, what was going to happen to that, you know, it was pretty early in the year. So it was an opportune time to pull back the reins and uh, take a, a slower approach uh, and put some, you know, defer some projects until we could better understand what the impacts would be to sales tax funding. Um, I think we're all pleasantly surprised that sales tax funding has not been as heavily damaged as one might have guessed. Uh, although I can only imagine how bad it would be damaged if uh, the state hadn't passed a few years ago, uh, the ability to collect sales tax on internet sales, because that's obviously been driving a lot of business. Um, and our, our funding, our budget for next year in, uh, in how we've structured the sales tax allocations uh, incorporates the best uh, approximations of the Office of Financial Management. So they, they basically set some standards that all the rest of the departments incorporate into their budget. So if, if they think based on all of their you know, crystal ball magicianry, that it's going to be a 10% cut to sales tax. That's what we all roll in and work with. And yeah. they've been a very thoughtful partner in this. Plus, uh, longstanding history of fiscal offices everywhere. They're more conservative than anybody else wants to be uh, because they don't want a bunch of bills coming due when there's no money in the coffers. So we feel like we're in a pretty good place. We feel good about um, what we conserved our funds on this year and uh, what our budget is uh, appropriated at for next year. Good, uh, good. Uh, Tina, can we have the slideshow now? I see Elle Hardy's, I mean, that's the, that's the highlight of my evening that uh, mm -hmm. Elle's here. So we're gonna get to Elle at some point. So we're gonna go with the slideshow. Yes, and um, again, this is, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen again here. This is again, a. a slightly different way and a new way of doing things. So I'm, I'm hoping that there will be no technical glitches, but um, we've had each of the subject matter experts uh, recording. And so uh, without any further ado, let me share my screen again. And 
Yeah. Thank you, Nick, for that reminder. So I'm just going to launch here. Hi, everyone. I'm Tina Nielsen, and we're here to talk about the 2021 Parks and Open Space Improvement Projects. So in 2021, we have proposed 12 projects in the seven categories shown on the map by their different colors. The categories are agriculture, ecosystems, forestry and fire, historic preservation, public education, recreation and facilities. And new this year, we are proposing a project projects for water resources. So in this slide, you can see the budget for each of the seven categories, along with the number of projects within each category. The total budget this year is a little over $500,000, which is a decrease from our normal $775,000 budget, uh, which was a decision we made due to the, the economic impacts of COVID-19. However, the good news is that through grants and partner funding, we are able to leverage our budget quite considerably to about five times that amount. So next up, we're gonna have presentations from category managers and other staff on projects in each of these categories. And uh, at the end, we'll take any questions you might have. Hello, this is Jason Sauer with Ag Resource Management. I am the Ag Project Coordinator, and I'm going to be talking about the two projects that Ag has for 2021. The two projects that Ag has for 2021 are the Barrett Center Pivot and the Hygiene Dairy Produce Handling Facility. On this slide, you can see the location of the Barrett Center Pivot, which is just north of Longmont, Colorado. Here you can see how the center pivot is located on the Barrett property. This project is an NRCS equip grant funded project, which will improve productivity. The main cropping system on this property right now is grass hay, but with the center pivot, it will allow our current tenant and future tenants to uh, expand their cropping systems. Next project I'll be talking about is the hygiene dairy washing facility, which you can see on the map indicated with the yellow dot. The 2021 Hygiene Dairy Produce Handling Facility is for engineering for a future building that would be constructed for the current tenant for him to process his produce to be sold to the public. Hello, David Hurt, Senior Plant Ecologist and the POSIP representative for the Ecosystems Group. In 2021, the Ecosystems Group has two projects on board, phase two of a countywide wetland assessment and the Niwot Ditch Fish Passage Project. It's well recognized that wetlands are one of the most valuable and sensitive ecological resources within Boulder County and the arid west. Not only do they harbor unique plant species and associations, but they provide critical habitat to over 80% of the wildlife species, despite only occupying less than 3% of the landscape in the state. POS has done assessments in the past. We first did them in 1999, um, but we haven't done any since 2003. Since that time, we've seen a lot of changes. We've acquired a lot of new properties. Many of those have some significant wetlands on them. And we've also seen some changes to the wetlands we did originally assess uh, due to human impacts to hydrology, non-native species, and perhaps climate change. So this project started in 2020 and originally had $35,000 of funding from the POS Foundation and $15,000 from POSIP. Uh, due to cuts in POSIP, the POS Foundation stepped up and put in uh, $50,000 in 2020 towards this project. We solicited Proposals from consultants, we got 17 in all, and uh, that bids came in at anywhere from 110,000 to nearly half a million, so well over our budget of $50,000. We selected three of our top choices, and they were all interested in doing the work at a reduced scope. And then 
resource management and plant ecology chipped in an extra twenty thousand dollars from our operating funds just so we could get a little more of the work done uh, our final choice included staff from the colorado natural heritage program um, and they're the ones who really specialize in this type of thing throughout the state and we were using their ecological integrity assessment protocol for colorado wetlands so it's great to have them on board their staff their field staff their gis staff worked with our plant ecology and gis staff um, and we were able to incorporate all the data we needed to collect into this mobile device form so they could just use it on phones or on tablets out in the field and collect the data the data includes all kinds of metrics including vegetation hydrology uh, water quality uh, the quality of the surrounding buffer and landscape um, of the wetland you're looking at one of the biggest differences between this assessment and ones we've done in the past is more of a focus on the vegetation um, because that's really where you see changes you can see the first changes um, to a wetland you may visit a wetland and there's a foot of water there you could visit the same wetland uh, at a different time of year and it'd be dry uh, but the changes to the vegetation often you know provide insight into what else may be happening uh, to the wetland that's not visible to the eye so this year we visited 31 properties mapped nearly 100 wetlands and completed comprehensive assessments on 47 of them due to the limited budget we dropped um, we originally proposed doing some uh, wetlands assessments on some of our larger ces we had to drop those and we really focused on wetlands that were deemed significant in the past and this work will really serve to prioritize our wetlands for conservation see which ones score the highest and really need protection and identify which ones may uh, benefit from restoration and really serve as a baseline uh, for moving forward in the next generation of staff here at pos to track changes to this to these wetlands and this critical resource hi everyone my name is sarah hearts and i'm a resource planner and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Niwot Ditch Diversion and Fish Passage Project. This project is located on St. Vrain Creek between 75th Street and Airport Road on our Golden Freedstrom property and private land owned by the Golden Land Company. And this map shows the project location with the Parks and Open Space Office labeled for context. This section of St. Vrain Creek is within the Mountains to Plain Transition Zone which is a high priority habitat type for many native fish species and is also home to numerous irrigation diversion dams like the Niwot that block fish passage and fragment populations. The Niwot diversion is shared by three ditches, the Niwot, the Hager's Meadow, and the Northwestern Mutual. The existing dam was constructed as an emergency flood repair and was not necessarily constructed for resilience and longevity. And the dam in its current configuration is at risk of failure and in need of replacement. Boulder County has been working with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Colorado Trout Unlimited, the City of Longmont, and ditch shareholders and landowners to complete this project since 2016. And the Niwot Diversion Project has two primary goals. The first is to improve the diversion to benefit water users by creating a more resilient and reliable structure. And the second is to restore native fish passage and riparian habitat to benefit multiple species and improve stream health. The photos on this slide, starting from the top left, show the structure of the current dam which consists of piled up angular boulders and concrete. And this creates an impoundment of water on the upstream side of the diversion and a vertical drop on the downstream side. The diversion is leaky, meaning that it may not be able to meet the requirement of sweeping the creek when flows are 25 CFS or lower. And it creates a barrier for fish passage. In its current configuration, the Niwot Diversion Dam has also altered the stream hydrology in this reach. To solve these issues, our plan is to remove the existing dam and replace it with a series of boulder riffles that will be filled in with appropriately sized gravel and cobble. So the new diversion will look like a stream channel 
and it will allow native fish to swim upstream and downstream whenever water is flowing. The top folder riffle will be set at the elevation needed to divert water and deliver it to the ditch headgates. And as I mentioned earlier, the planning and implementation of this project has been a collaborative effort between Boulder County Parks and Open Space, Colorado Trout Unlimited, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and CPW. And that's because of its potential to benefit our transit transition zone fishes and improve riparian habitat for species like the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse. And multiple agencies have invested financial and in-kind resources to the project. The numbers on this slide represent the contributions for 2021, but Colorado Trout Unlimited, CPW, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have all made substantial financial and in-kind contributions in the years leading up to this point. The POSIP contribution is specifically to support the additional engineering that will be needed to complete the floodplain permitting for this project, including the Lomer and Asbilt survey, which will be completed after construction. Hi, I'm Stephen Reinald, the Senior Forestry Resource Specialist, and I'm going to talk about the one forestry project we have for 2021. So uh, the project we have is our Sherwood Gulch project, which is uh, located just south of Caribou, um, right above the Conger Mine. Um, it is a couple hundred acre uh, project area where we plan to do 100 acres of forestry treatment. So this map identifies the larger project area, which is 240 acres. We intend to do the 100 acre project in the red area located on this map. Um, the red area is a little bit larger than 100 acres, um, but that's the location that we would like to treat. Um, it is a south facing slope. Um, the blue area in the center is a riparian area, and then the green area is a, is a north facing slope. Uh, the reason it's all on this map is we collected data from the whole area uh, for possible future treatments. Um, so we wanted to do this project for a while, but what is making it a little bit more enticing is that we applied for uh, State Fire Assistance, SFA, uh, WUI, Wildland Urban Interface, uh, a grant program, and we were awarded this uh, 2019 funding. And so that's why we'd like to move forward. Um, the goal of our project is to decrease overall densities uh, increase or expand the, the existing meadows that we find in there, uh, but also to pro provide an anchor point for fire suppression. So uh, the Cold Springs fire um, happened just over a mile to the east, and so uh, we know that there are um, the possibility of, of fires in these locations. <laughs> um, the other thing we would like to do is increase the structural diversity, the age diversity, and the species diversity uh, across the property area. Um, this area is interesting because the red area actually has, uh, even though it's at higher elevations, actually has a good amount of ponderosa pine and, and some healthy ponderosa pine in there. And uh, in, in light of climate change, uh, having some of these lower elevational species on the landscape is pretty beneficial. And so we're hoping to kind of push and promote um, having uh, ponderosa pine on the landscape. So a lot of the material uh, being removed is going to be focused on lodgepole pine, or uh, just providing a more open uh, ponderosa pine structure. Um, so the, the funding for this, uh, this, since Forestry does a lot of their projects over the winter, we're actually looking for uh, two years of POSIP funding um, from both the 2021 and 2022 budget. Um, the matching funds, um, th th these would be matching funds to the SFA grant, which is gonna provide 245,000. The additional in-kind match, uh, while it looks like a lot, 110,000, um, it's actually, we only need uh, 40,000 of match uh, for this project, uh, but we wanted to make sure we were showing that there's a lot more that's going into this um, from, from this point forward. So uh, that's about it. Thanks. Hi everyone, this is Carol Beam, Cultural Resource Specialist for Parks and Open Space. In 2021, we have one historic preservation project, and that is Brawley Barn Phase 2. Brawley Barn Phase 2 is seen as the last 
structural repair project for the barn and will address the tasks that were not able to be completed in phase one due to the grant funding limitations. The phase one project was completed on October 9, 2020 by contractor and focused on the major structural deficiencies of the barn. Phase one and phase two do not address public access inside the barn, but again, focus primarily on keeping the barn standing up. Future phases will be required if the department desires to have public access inside the barn. The Buildings and Historic Preservation Work Group will complete phase two since it's a smaller project and able to be fitted into their 2021 schedule. Phase two will focus on the dairy barn addition, the loading chute, and tasks like repairing or reconstructing the main barn's windows and doors, plus any other small miscellaneous repairs that were not able to be addressed in phase one. The highlight of the project will be the reconstructing, reconstruction of the historic wood cap on the poured concrete silo at the front of the barn and seen at the lower left photo of the slide. This is referred to as the fireman's hat due to its resemblance, of course, in the shape of a fireman's hat. This is it for the 2021 Historic Preservation Projects. Hi everyone, I'm Pascal Freed with Education and Outreach and I'm gonna talk about the one project we have in POSIP um, that began this year in 2020 and will finish in 2021. This project is going to take place at the Agricultural Heritage Center. Uh, we are replacing three exhibits that were installed in 2000, 2001. So it's been nearly 20 years and it's really time for them to be replaced, partly due to the wear and tear in those exhibits, but also the messaging that we'd like to really have and the stories we want to tell at the Agricultural Heritage Center. The goal of these uh, replacing those three exhibits, and I believe it will probably replace it with anywhere between two and four. We're just not sure exactly what we will have since we're still in the discussion part and schematic drawings. As you can see in the middle of that screen, those faint green circles um, will be where we are replacing exhibits and we're starting that discussion of what that could be. Our goals really are just to broaden the interpretive story that we're telling at that site, to be more culturally inclusive, to really look at time back to the Paleo Indian time, historic Native American, and really our rich history of immigrants who've come to this area to help really grow the agricultural um, business in Boulder County. Our themes, and if you look to the on the left side, these are three that I, I feel like are going to be, you know, really three that we will see there. We want to talk about what is native versus not native, you know, local food versus what we are importing from the region, from the country, perhaps outside this country. We also want to really talk about the history of sugar and really sugar beets in this area, because that's the story of immigrant workers. Uh, we had, of course, some before that time, but that really brought in a really a big wave of new people working and living in Boulder County. And finally, that last slide is really the new immigrant stories and what they brought to the county um, through the talk about food. So food's going to be a major uh, theme throughout our, our uh, exhibits. And really, I think uh, when it's said and done, we're trying to say that this area, the agricultural heritage area, Longmont, Boulder County, has really provided the resources for humans to survive through the beginning of time. Good evening. This is Al Hardy, the Recreation and Facilities Manager. We have three capital projects this year for recreation and facilities. A trail along 104th Street in the southeast part of the county by Carolyn Holmberg Preserve at Rock Creek Farm. Then we have an improved ADA access at the McIntosh Barn at the Agricultural Heritage Center. And lastly, we have the Tolan Ranch Trail construction, which is located southwest of Netherland. The 104th Street Connector Trail between Coal Creek and Rock Creek Regional Trails has been envisioned for a long time. The Boulder County Comprehensive Plan 1998 Trail Map and also the 2002 Rock Creek Farm Management Plan Amendment had the idea of a connection in the area between these two trails. The Boulder County Comprehensive Plan also states that the county will work with cities to assure linkages of county trails. In addition, 
It has also been a formal trail request and priority for many years from both the city of Louisville and the city of Lafayette through the county's annual community trail request process. The connector will be from the Stearns Lake Trailhead on the south to the Empire Road area north of Highway 42 and would total approximately 2.6 miles. In addition to having a management plan amendment done in 2019 for the first 0.6 miles of trail on Carolyn Holmberg at Rock Creek Farm property, the 2002 jointly owned Lafayette Louisville Open Space Management Plan properties associated with this connection all stated the need for this trail. This trail also fits into the commissioner's strategic priority related to creating more trail connectivity among municipal neighborhoods, local open spaces, and regional trails. The project is a partnership with the city of Louisville and the city of Lafayette for an estimated $1.3 million. Louisville has been awarded a $475,000 in federal related transportation funds with the balance of the project dollars subject to the partners and or finding additional funding. 2021 activities will be hiring a consultant to do the design and permitting, permitting related work and construction would be anticipated to start in 2022. Boulder County share is $83,000 in 2021. The 1881 McIntosh Barn was landmarked by the county in 1997. The barn underwent an exterior rehabilitation and structural stabilization in 2001 as part of the creation of the Agricultural Heritage Center. Originally during the special use approval process, it was envisioned to be on the northwest side of the barn, which was problematic as the point considered was in CDOT right away. We explored options with our education and outreach staff and landed on the idea of coming into the barn on the northeast side with a small ramp that would then allow for access into the main barn area where educational programming is done. Nothing is easy, but we have a building permit to do the work associated with the ADA ramp, lighting improvements, and structural requirements related to newer building codes and the need for the barn to meet community planning and per permitting assembly code. This project will will be completed by the Buildings and Historic Preservation staff with Brian Bartle being the lead, along with public works electricians that will install required lighting for the visitor use. Our ground staff may also be involved with trenching for the expanded electrical service and the site work outside the barn. Total cost for the materials and public works staff labor is 15,300. The Tolan Ranch Trail project area is located along the 30-foot trail easement held by Boulder County near 911, Colorado. The trail corridor is located within the Colorado State Forest Service Tolan Ranch Conservation Easement, which protects over 3,000 acres of land. Elevation ranges from 9,000 to 10,000 feet in moderate to rugged terrain with areas of dense forest. The Tolan Ranch trail construction started in 2020 with plans for 2021 to utilize a contractor to construct the majority of the 5.3 mile connector between U.S. Forest Service West Magnolia Trails and U.S. Forest Service Jenny Creek Trail. Staff and volunteers would also be utilized to finish up the, the section of the trail started in 2020 and also installing fencing, gates, and signage. The goal of the trail construction is to build a sustainable, natural surface, non-motorized, multi-use trail while protecting the natural and cultural resources of the area. Funding is a grant from Colorado Parks and Wildlife and funds made available to Boulder County Parks and Open Space through its Mike O'Brien Fund. The trail will not be open in the winter and we also could assume that construction could extend into 2022. Hi, this is Audrey Butler, Water Resource Program Supervisor. Water Resources has two post-it projects in 2021, the first of which will be Prince Lake Number 2 Dam and Reservoir Rehabilitation, the first phase of that project, and then the Bailey-Kenosha Diversion Reconstruction Project.
Prince Lake 2 is a reservoir in southeast Boulder County that sits on the Eddy Open Space property just north of 287 in Arapahoe. The property was acquired in 2000. The reservoir itself was built in 1893 as an agricultural reservoir and is the capacity in which it still serves today. As with all reservoirs, Prince Lake Number 2 has seen its fair share of infrastructure breakdowns and sedimentation over the last 127 years, as well as shoestring budget fixes and maintenance. In addition to the existing infrastructure upgrade needs, in 2018, we were issued a letter from the state engineer's office letting us know that they had increased the hazard class of Prince Lake Number 2 from low hazard to significant hazard based on a new inundation analysis they had completed for development projects in coordination with the town of Erie. As a result of this increase, they alerted us to the fact that the existing infrastructure already in need of upgrade no longer sufficed in terms of size and capacity. This put us into a scenario where we needed to make immediate progress and modifications to the reservoir. So in 2021, Parks contracted a storage capacity curve to be completed to better understand the existing storage situation. The 2021 POSIP project will be the next step in this series of efforts to bring the reservoir into compliance. The Prince Lake Number 2 Reservoir Reconstruction Project combines public safety, infrastructure, resiliency, and compliance with state regulations with the overarching goals of providing for viable agriculture, climate resiliency, and protecting our water rates. The $45,000 committed in 2021 will be used for alternatives analysis and preliminary design with the hopes of going to construction in late 2021 or 2022. Our staff will be leading the design process and consulting with the state engineer's office with respect to design and construction requirements for significant hazard class dams. In addition to protecting the residents of Brownsville and coming into compliance with state dam safety regulations, this project will help protect the water rights by restoring the decreed volume and preventing abandonment of said water rights. This will in turn protect the long-term viability of the agriculture and operations dependent on Prince Lake Number 2. So in 2021, Parks contracted a storage capacity curve to be completed to better understand the existing storage situation. The 2021 POSIP project will be the next step in this series. So the Bailey Kenosha project will combine staff safety with improved infrastructure resiliency and more efficient deliveries and use of our water rights, as well as the overarching goal of maintaining and protecting wetlands and ecosystem resources in the county. The $10,000 committed for 2021 will go towards design and construction of a catwalk and pulley type system that will be attached to the concrete structure that will keep our staff out of the dam and allow it to be managed from beside and above the dam instead of directly in the flow path. The design will be based off of other designs we have seen at other ditches around the county um, and will be contracted out to a fabricator to make the necessary changes. This will allow staff to pull up dam boards and clean any debris, again, from outside of the dam, uh, which will take them out of harm's way and also provide efficiencies when actually going out there to do management. We've made several small infrastructure changes over time with the help of Jeff Cox and Jeff Shaw and others in the Ag Resources Group. Uh, and this project will go a long way to finishing that goal of making this water right more manageable, uh, more efficient and safer. All right. Is that, is Tina, is that it? That's it. Okay. <laughs> hey, you're not going to give us a quiz, are you? <laughs> a lot of information. Good stuff. A lot. And a, a lot. lot. Hey, uh, let's do this. Let's just go. We got a couple minutes for questions. So let's just go uh, through the group. Uh, Tony, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, Tina, nice to meet you as well. Um, thank you for the great presentation. I really loved the way you guys did the presentation. It's really nice to hear from all the staff. Um, my question is um, similar to the last meeting, um, the Agricultural Heritage Center. I'm really curious in the redesign of the three uh, potential uh, exhibits there, if they're gonna be done in Spanish as well as in English. And I asked that um, from our last meeting, I was kind of assured that a lot of the signage is now going to be in Spanish as we move forward. Just a quick uh, survey of four or five different uh, open space properties I did. 
the only thing in Spanish are the rules and regs, right? Not the welcome to this place or here are all the amenities. It's like, don't do this and don't do that in English and in Spanish. So I'm really curious about the upgrade to the exhibits at the Agricultural Center. That is a really good question, Tony. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Pascal is not with us, but um, um, Therese or Eric, do you know if there's a plan for that? So uh, that is a very good question. I know that we have put a lot of effort into our cultural responsive and inclusiveness strategic plan. We call it our CRISP plan. And uh, as a result of that, all of our future signs are going to be bilingual. Uh, so I will check and make sure that our interpretive signs are included in, the, in that. I do believe that is that is our plan. And I know uh, like if you were out there now, all of our signs are not yet converted, but what our plan is every new sign is both in English and in Spanish. So good question. We can follow up for to be sure that those interpretive signs are gonna be in Spanish too. I think it's highly likely. That'd be great. I'd love to know. Thanks. Scott. Do you have anything? Um, just a comment. Um, uh, just kind of, um, I guess, an irony in the Agricultural Resource Center building a new display about the history of sugar beets in Boulder County at the time when they're getting ready to take the crop that built Boulder County farmers and take it away from open space farmers. That's all. Well, <laughs> thank you for that, Scott. Uh, Heather, any, any questions? Uh, no, thank you for the great presentation. I really enjoyed the format tonight, uh, but I, I don't have any questions. <laughs> thank you, Heather. Paula? Yeah, um, Tina, it was great presentation, so thank you for that. Um, I do have one question and, and my pet project, of course, is the St. Green Greenway Trail extension from Longmont into uh, towards hygiene. Um, I see that's not on the list for 2021. Um, and I certainly understand the reasons for cutting back, but I don't know if it was originally on there and was one of the cut projects or not. But I would like to encourage you to look at at least piecing and moving towards that with some design money and acquisition. I should have asked Mel when he was still with us um, if there was any uh, land acquisition uh, movement on that property. It's my understanding from the city of Longmont that they plan on constructing the piece out in that direction. So basically along airport road in this next year or at least starting construction in this next year. So to become a truly regional trail and um, provide some of the opportunities. I'm thinking Westview Middle School, getting out to Pella Ponds, as well as just the uh, re recreational appreciation in times of COVID and beyond. To have that um, additional trail length would be a real huge importance. So just don't want it to completely go off your, your radar screen and um, I'll keep pushing for it as well. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, thank you, pa Paula. Can I just um, say that um, Al Hardy is here with us, so um, Al might have an update on that. Maybe not right. a great update, but uh, yes, I mean, that's, you know, the difference is we have our regional trails in the county that are funded by a, a different sales tax, basically, okay. through Boulder County Transportation. So mm -hmm. the project is being worked on. We basically are trying to, and this is where I'm a little vague too on the acquisition piece, we're, we're looking at a, a different piece than what we currently have access to, to, to make it align better to, to get to Pella. Um, so I know we're still actively working on it, and that is definitely a project that is already funded in terms of at least having dollars available. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So that's transportation money, not parks and open space. That is okay. correct. Great, thank you. Uh, Stephen, do you have anything? Uh, I, uh, it's an, it seems like an ambitious agenda and I appreciate the presentation. I had a question for Al about mm -hmm. the Tolan Trail as to whether there's gonna be equestrian access on that trail. 
Yes, there is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Trace. Uh, yes, this qu question is um, uh, probably be for uh, Stefan uh, regarding the Sherwood Gulch forestry thinning. And there are uh, at least two um, almost but not quite official trails in that uh, drainage. And what will be the access uh, during the thinning and whether the thinning will change the character of the trails? Hi, so yeah, this is uh, Stefan Reynolds, senior forester, and certainly I can answer that. Um, so it's a thinning operation. So um, I'm well aware of those trails. Uh, access to the project will use the, the two existing roads, the one that goes down uh, near the Conger mine uh, and the other that kind of comes through past the caretaker's house. Um, but in, in terms of, it's, it's gonna be an open forest structure. So it's still gonna be forested. We're gonna actually, I think it's actually going to look better. Um, um, and there's some really beautiful, large ponderosa pine in that area, some actually large Douglas fir as well. Um, so we're, we're really excited how it's going to look afterwards. I think it'll actually improve that trail corridor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trace. Uh, I do not have any questions. So with that, I will, uh, Chair will entertain a motion at this time. This is Paula. Um, I would move that we um, recommend approval for the 2021 post-SIP and stewardship projects as described by staff. Heather Williams, I second the motion. Thank you, ladies. Uh, this time, is there any online public comments? No comments online. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there any further discussion? Okay. Donna? Oh, I'm sorry. Is this just for this comp for the what you're voting on? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I did I did enjoy really hearing about the projects and, and, and thank you for putting all that work. All right. I thank saw you. something else I want to thank say. You. So sorry. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so uh, at this time, uh, with no further discussion among POSAC members. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, one further question yeah. of discussion. Um, and for uh, Tina, I understand that um, th there are other topics in the stewardship fund that we didn't get to tonight that we will have a chance to discuss at future POSAC meetings. Is that true? Yes, that's true. And if I could just take a minute and set the stage a little bit. Um, I covered it in the memo to some extent, but um, I wanted to just um, kind of draw your attention to the fact that we're talking about um, revenues from our sales tax money, uh, money that we get from our sales tax, open space sales tax. Um, we're kind of reconfiguring how we do this. And so we've always funded capital projects, mostly out of that revenue. In some cases we've used um, ag lease revenue to help fund the ag projects, but um, most of it comes from sales tax funding. Um, we have um, the ability to broaden the, the, the range of things that we do with that money, and that's where the stewardship fund comes in. Um, the things that have been identified for that pot are um, coming out of this two year long internal process that we've been engaged in, and that's what, where we'll be coming back to you to talk a lot more about that next year. Um, I believe we're planning to do a presentation, an overall presentation in January, and then, um, and then give you kind of work group updates on a monthly basis to, to let you get a little bit more insight into all the things that are, that are happening. But uh, our operational budgets come out of the um, general fund, which is property taxes. So um, the sales tax revenue really helps us broaden what we can do Ultimately, what we'd like to do is right, right size our operational budgets so that we know that what we're doing is strategic and, and we, we have enough money and personnel to do the things that we, we need to do on an ongoing basis. And, um, and so we're, we're very much still in this process and we will be for a while. And um, so you'll be hearing a lot more about it. I'm, I'm sorry we didn't take time to spend, you know, to talk more about those stewardship projects, but you will hear more about them. Um, over the coming months. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now let's uh, let's let's vote on the motion, please. So, 
Uh, all those in favor of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Is there any abstentions? Let the record show the motion's been approved. And I would ask uh, all of us, if you have questions for Tina, uh, I think Tina's open to this. We can, we can email you, touch bases with you, uh, follow up with you as we go forward with this. I would just echo the one statement that I think Stephen said. It, there's a lot there. And I know you guys tried to cut back, but that's a pretty aggressive, you know, it's pretty aggressive, but uh, I think all very good projects. So best of luck with all of that. Thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight and thank everybody on the presentation, please, on behalf of Pozak. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, is Eric still with us? Yep, still here. Yeah. Eric, would you, uh, do you have an update for us tonight? I do. Um, so I want to give you a quick update on the real estate transactions that we've been able to uh, complete since the November POSAC meeting. Um, I, think, I think people probably know, but I think it was the POSAC, the day we had POSAC last month is when we closed on the CenturyLink conservation easement and uh, Boulder County invested two and a quarter million dollars and Jefferson County invested one and a half million dollars to help the town of Superior acquire that property. It's 182 acres and we will jointly hold the CE with uh, Jefferson County. And then uh, you might recall back in the summer, we acquired the Canino 7M ranch on the uh, south side of Longmont. When we did that, we had an option to acquire an additional 29 shares of Boulder and White Rock water. So we did that. Um, we closed on the Chandler property, which is the property um, on the north end of the diagonal up by Longmont. We paid a one and a quarter million for that. Uh, and we hope to sell the fee title to a tenant farmer next year. Uh, and if we get that deal together, uh, we'll be bringing that back to POSAC to review it before it goes to the board uh, for a public hearing. And then lastly, we acquired uh, 41 shares of left hand water in a separate deal for uh, about $209,000. So those are some acquisition things that have been happening in the last month. And then in the other accomplishment department, uh, Tuesday, the board approved a management plan update to, um, to Carolyn Holmberg Preserve at Rock Creek Farm. Um, it had some modifications from the plan that we presented. I, I'm happy to go into that in detail if you want. I would say the overall theme of the changes was to temper some of the additional trails and trailheads and to clarify uh, their expectations for uh, managing prairie dogs uh, and, and spending the next year uh, diving into literature and consulting with experts to try to find a new way to deal with a problem that we've not yet been able to surmount. Um, so right now, staff are working to update that plan to incorporate the direction from the board and we'll take the complete update to the board for final approval at their January 5th business meeting. Um, other highlights, uh, Parks and State staff completed their comments on Gross Reservoir and we submitted those to CPP. Um, on, the, on the CRISP side, um, one thing that's been really great is that our management team and also the staff who are on the Cultural Responsiveness and Inclusion Committee for the department um, have recently completed a couple of meetings with partners um, who represent a diversity of Latinx nonprofits, um, and they are helping us explore and envision how we can better engage and serve the Latinx community in the future. Um, those meetings were arranged and facilitated by the Trestle Group, who is our consultant that's helping us develop the CRISP, the Strategic Plan on Cultural Responsiveness and Inclusion. So that's been really wonderful, and I think all of our staff have really enjoyed it and gotten a lot out of it. And we're starting to build some, some really good relationships. Um, Rangers are upgrading their communication capabilities so that they're fully compatible with the sheriff's office and other emergency response services. Um, and we've been able to access some federal funding for that through the CARES Act, which will be supplemented next year by sales tax funds. And then in the fire recovery department, um, just a few broad brush highlights. Um, we're working with the NRCS, uh, Emergency Watershed Protection Program, 
to make available federal funding for things like aerial mulching and check dam installation in the burned area of Heil, which is about half of the fire, the Calwood fire, uh, the conservation easements and private property um, that are in the remaining uh, 5,000 or so acres. Um, we're going to be needing wood to mulch the burned area. So our forestry staff is, is trying to locate and calculate what we need um, from our sort yards and forest service projects and urban lemon tree diversion and that sort of thing. And the forestry and trail staff are working to address the hazard trees that are around trails and access roads at Heil. There's still uh, about three miles, over three miles of trail and road that we still need to clear of burned and dangerous trees in order to safely be able to open up the southern trails at Heil. But we have reopened the Pictured Rock Trail out of Lyons, which connects up to uh, part of the Wild Turkey Trail that we've opened and the Ponderosa, the Ponderosa, the Ponderosa Loop. Um, and that is the update other than to say, uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but also wish you all uh, happy holidays, especially Festivus, to all of you. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Does anybody have any questions for Eric? No, we're, we're we, you're good we're to go. Done, Eric. We're toast. <laughs> we're, I'm, we're, I know I'm, I'm toast, but listen, thank you. Uh, same just thing. Have one, one comment, Jim Paula Fitzgerald here. I hiked the uh, Picture Rock Trail this week and it's just fantastic, and it's really also very interesting to see what the burn did up there and and, yeah. um, and all that. So I, I really appreciate the county opening that section up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Eric, and one comment I'll give you is that just out and about, of course, you know, nobody knows who, who I am, but I probably have heard three or four stories, if you can get this back to Blevin, uh, three or four stories of stuff during the fires that the rangers did just sort of random acts of kindness stuff people didn't expect them to do people who didn't know who they were so i uh, i'm sure you've done it i'm sure the county commissioners have done it but i think uh your team particularly the i mean all of them but particularly the rangers on on the fire you know hats off to them this christmas time for sure yeah good. thanks and um yeah a lot of staff have participated in that i think the other group that gets a lot of credit um for uh, swift and diligent action is the fairground staff because yes. you know when there's an emergency they turn into a, a emergency receiving center for livestock of all kinds and one of my favorite photos um, that I took and some other folks took is all of these shires in one pen and there's one llama there <laughs> it's yeah. like there's all these giant horses yeah. and a llama kind of looking a little bewildered about the whole thing but um, you know they when we get horses and livestock, we have to have staff, you know, 24 seven, which makes for a lot of late nights and requests from vets to collect samples and all sorts of stuff. So um, they also do a big heavy lift and we're very proud of them. They did a great job. I think, I think people from the uh, equestrian community really appreciate what went on there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'll pass that along. I appreciate it. Everybody be safe and have a good holiday and happy new year to y'all. Okay. Same to you. January. Jim, I think I think you uh, missed our public invited to be heard person who was waiting for the end. Donna. Yeah. Donna, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you. Please go ahead. I'm sorry, I forgot. Please make your comments. We're wrapping up, but please, I'm gonna go have at it. Okay, thank you. I just want to thank everyone for the work and, and the projects going forward. Um, and I also want to thank you all for the list of the oven space um, changes that need to be made to be updated to be, to be more accurate in the Boulder Valley comp plan update. Um, you made a list. I did want to notice that Sombrero Ranch and Orange Orchard was not listed in that list. They are also um, on your open space map. Um, the other thing is that I, I still am a little bewildered as to why these aren't being updated at this time. It's, I mean, they've been acquired. I don't understand why we can't just update them. Um, so if it can happen during this update, that would be great. If it can't happen during this update, um, when is this going to actually happen? Um, and I, I hope Eric's still on, but Eric, I'd like to get together with you 
after the holidays and beginning of the year. And, you know, we can have this list and, you know, put it forward and, and you know, let's get it done. Let's make the map, the Boulder Valley Comp Plan land use map accurate. So um, I missed the first two minutes, I think, of this meeting. So they said something about map change. I, I missed, I don't know if it had anything to do with this or if it was something else. You know, I was just, uh, Donna, that was just one of the POSAC members on, on the vote that was taken last month made the changes. Oh, and I think, oh, okay. Donna, you submitted, hey Donna, you've submitted in writing, right? Your suggested, the things that you've noticed on the map, right? Or you'd like to see fixed? Uh, yeah, I actually put in a change in land use request. Okay. That it's not even just the open space properties. Like I said, okay. there's one property that is listed as open space acquired that's owned by another entity, you know, yeah. that's next to like Twin Lakes. Yeah. So there's other things within the map that, but POZAC, yeah and you know parks and open space are dealing with their properties I right. that's why there's this list which i mean it was very thorough i mean when you guys actually came up with the list so um or somebody from staff came up with this list which looks pretty good except like i mentioned there's some Brero ranch and orange orchard yeah. that i noticed wasn't on the list so um like i said i can get together with um eric and you know why don't we do this, Donna, for tonight? Why don't you plan, if that's okay with Eric, why don't you just plan to follow up with him? You're, okay. If you've submitted what you, what you, you know, su your suggestions will go into the record, so that's captured. And then okay. I just ask you to follow up with him in January. I think it's the best route. Okay, yeah, that's All right. With the, the holidays coming up, it's kind of crazy anyways. You but um, yeah, yeah, so everyone have a safe and ha happy and healthy, healthy, hopefully, holiday and Thank you for all you do and thank you for your work. And I'll, you, um, Eric, if you're still on, I will um, check in with you after the new year. <laughs> all righty. Thank you. Thank you all. That is, I'm, I'm now leaving. <laughs> Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs>